Lewin. I am a PhD student in the lab of Idan Segev. I've been here like forever. Um, yeah, I'm at Hebrew U in Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, so this is basically going to be a presentation of all of my uh, dissertation work, which is, it's uh, basically, it, it's five papers. This is the first time I've presented everything at the same time. So this is a little, a little bit of a dry run for my dissertation defense, which is not yet scheduled. Um, so it's a lot of material. Feel free to interrupt me in, in the middle. I'm Israeli, I'm very used to that. But with the caveat that I recorded myself uh, giving this talk and it takes me 47 minutes and 10 seconds without interruptions. So, uh, but with that in mind, uh, feel free to interrupt me if you don't understand something. Um, right, so let's see how I change. Oh, let's go here. Okay, so I am interested in um, a similar question to what I think you at Numenta are all interested in is that we have these linear neurons that, uh, that people use in machine learning and artificial neural networks. And uh, you have your inputs, those are the Xs. Each, you multiply each input by a synaptic weight, those are the Ws. You sum up the weighted inputs, you pass them through a threshold function, and the, the neuron returns either a spike or no spike. And you put together uh, big networks of these neurons, and that's how you get deep neural net nets. Um, and these neurons were inspired by real biological neurons in the brain. So this, these are drawings by uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, uh, neuroanatomist, one of the fathers of neuroscience. These are pyramidal neurons. Um, so you can see the basic structures here of, uh, of the neurons. So you have the dendrites. In pyramidal neurons, you have two regions of, of dendrites. So dendrites are the input regions, and those are those branches that you see here. So this region, these are the basal dendrites. Up here would be the apical dendrites, unless this is hippocampus, in which it's the opposite. No, but these are basal dendrites. This is the soma, that's the cell body. Um, and uh, I should say also, so on the dendrites, you see these little bumps, which are the spine. So that's where other um, neurons synapse onto the dendrite. That's where other neurons make their connections. And you have this thin line here marked with an A. Those are uh, the axons, that's the output region of the neuron. And so um, real neurons um, have all these, these complexities that are not necessarily captured by this linear neuron model of uh, something that just uh, takes the sum of the weighted inputs. Um, in terms of uh, where I fit into this picture of the question of neural computation, so I am a student of Idan Segev. Idan Segev is a student of Wilfred Rall, um, who, who passed away, um, uh, I think, a year ago, a couple years ago. And uh, Rawl was one of the pioneers of what is known as um, cable theory or neuronal cable theory. And the idea is that you can try to understand um, a biological neuron as a, um, as a series of resistor capacitor circuits. Um, so that's this compartmental model that you, that you see here. And the idea is that, that we can use um, our, our knowledge of how electrical circuits work. And if we think of how um, a real biological uh, neuron works, it, work, it works like one of these um, resistor capacitor models. And at least that's, uh, that's what experimental evidence seem, seems to tell us that this is how neurons work. They work like these extended um, circuits. And you can build detailed biological neurons or models of detailed biological neurons using these compartmental models. And you can perform simulations that will, um, within, within a certain tolerance, will reproduce what you expect to see if you are doing a real experiment in a real neuron. Um, and so what we do in the lab, um, many of us, not everyone, uh, is we work with these detailed biological models. Sometimes we build them, so we use, um, uh, we use data from experiments to reconstruct the morphology. We use data from uh, electrophysiological experiments to reproduce uh, the, the electrical properties of the neuron. Uh, I personally am not so involved in characterizing neurons. I'm more interested in plasticity and learning and using these kinds of neuron models to um, explore plasticity and learning. Uh, and I should say a lot of the things that I do are not necessarily using these cable models, but using other kinds of models. So I work at a variety, various different levels of abstraction. 
Um, so the first, um, oops, let's go back here. The first, the first paper in, in this dissertation is called Perceptron Learning and Classification in a Modeled Cortical Pyramidal Cell. Uh, the idea is that, um, well, first of all, so um, I'm sure you guys know this, but uh, uh, so neurons, this linear neuron model can be thought of as a, as a classifier. So if you have uh, two classes of objects, say uh, cats and dogs, to use the famous example that I hate, but you characterize your animals, uh, your, your objects by certain um, quantitative features. So in this case, it's domestic and size, and you can, you can then plot those objects in an, on an XY plane, or usually it's much higher dimensional. Um, and what the perceptron does, or what, what a linear neuron does, we also call it a perceptron, is it basically draws a line in between um, these two classes of objects because the equation for the linear neuron is actually basically the equation for a line in high dimensions, it's the hyperplane. Um, and uh, there's something called the perceptron learning algorithm, which basically tells the neuron how to modify its weights such that uh, everything, everything appears on the correct side of the line. I have a video here, but I, I think it's not necessary for anyone here. Unless, uh, is, is, is there anyone among you who is not well-versed in the perceptron? I, th I think you guys should all... be familiar with it. Yeah, okay. Um, so the idea of the biophysical perceptron is that just we're going to take this, this algorithm as is. So we modify the, the synaptic weights proportional to the inputs, and we're just going to put it on one of these detailed biological models of a neuron. Now, I did not, um, I did not create this neuron. This is a neuron that was created by a previous PhD student in the lab, Itai Chai. Uh, and he, he was really just interested in having a good model of a neuron. So he wasn't, this was not developed to do a machine learning task. I just took his neuron and was like, let's see if we can, we can run the perceptron learning algorithm on it. Um, so what we did was uh, we presented these uh, binary patterns to the neuron. So there were, um, uh, we had each, each pattern, each, each input vector is, um, is a thousand synapses large. And, and each of those input vectors, you randomly have 200 synapses that are, that are active, that are one, and uh, the rest, the other 800 would be zeros. And this is, uh, we're interested in characterizing the capacity of the neurons. We're not doing, um, we're not doing like a, uh, a benchmark like MNIST or something like that. What we're interested in is classification capacity. Classification capacity is the idea that if you, um, if you just randomly present input vectors to, to a neuron. So uh, if, you, if it's a small number of, of input vectors and you just randomly assign half of them, the neuron to spike and half of them, the neuron not to spike. Um, so if it's a small number of patterns, the neuron won't have a problem. If you start trying to load a large number of patterns on the neuron to be able to discriminate between the two classes, the neuron will tend to have a, a, a difficult time. And there is a lot of, um, theoretical literature about this. This is sort of an old school way of uh, evaluating classifiers. Um, we used it just because it's a lot easier to do binary patterns on a neuron than to train it to do, uh, you know, MNIST or CIFAR or whatever. Um, and a qu the, quick question on this. Yeah, um, sure. yeah, if you don't mind interruptions or <laughs> questions as we go. Um, was there any sort of uh, Cl clustering here or were the patterns the inputs were sort of randomly assigned to syn synapses throughout kind of the dendritic arbor yeah no so so this was um i believe that i tried to distribute the synapses uniformly so i i should say also that um that we were interested in in different regions of the dendrite because uh people think that um i mean in in cortex uh and really everywhere on the brain so the apical region and the basal region of dendrites, really they're getting inputs from different brain regions. So it was kind of an interesting question, like um, if we can uh, put these, store these patterns on, on these different parts. So, so we'll, we'll put uh, you know, all thousand synapses just on the apical top or just on the, on the basal tree. But there wasn't explicit clustering. We did it uniformly. My, the, next, um, the next paper is about clustering. OK. OK. Yeah. So I'll, I'll get, it's not, not on a biological neuron. Um, also, uh, there are some other people in the lab who are working on clustering of biological neurons. Um, right, so Bar Bartlett Mel had a paper, um, 
it wasn't the not the cluster on paper. He Bartlett Mel had a paper where he did supervised learning using just using clustering on a detailed biophysical model also. Mm -hmm. So so this is like yeah the, the same idea except this is just the perceptron learning algorithm. So um, the long story short here is that um, uh, it it works. Um, so I should say with, with the there is a okay there are a couple of, of caveats. Caveat number one is that because um, we're dealing with uh, with real synapses. So uh, synapses are either excitatory or inhibitory and the perceptron algorithm lets you just switch signs of synapses. So there's a version of the perceptron learning rule where um, if, you, if you try to, to go below zero, so if you try to switch the sign, um, it will just freeze it until it goes back up again. Um, and we're, we're only using excitatory synapses here. Um, uh, so, uh, so, but other than that, it's just it's basically the perceptron learning rule. Um, so you can, you can uh, store a hundred patterns, no problem. Uh, a thousand patterns, uh, no problem. With the caveat that if you put all the synapses on the apical tuft, uh, then you have re reduced classification capacity. So you do worse when you try to store a thousand patterns. I don't really want to get into it. Um, it has to do with um, a lot of like subtle biophysics things. Um, th this is a published paper, so you can look at it. The the main takeaway message from from this paper is that. Um, I would say that, yeah, if it wants to, a biological neuron can basically implement the perceptron learning algorithm as is, no problem, and it can act as a linear classifier, and you can store a lot of patterns on it. Um, we also did like a noise robustness task, which is sort of like a generalization task. I don't really want to get into it. It did fine on that also. Um, so that's, that's just like a good thing to know that a neuron can behave like a linear classifier if you want it to. Uh, OK, so that's point number one. Um, the, the second paper is called the gradient cluster on. Um, so here, uh, this has to do with synaptic clustering as we were talking about before. Um, uh, so, so here the idea is that instead of trying to think of a neuron as a simple linear neuron, we're going to try to learn from the quirks of biological neurons and see if we can maybe come up with a different model, a different learning algorithm. Um, so, there is uh, there is something called um, the NMDA receptor. So the NMDA receptor is both um, voltage gated and ligand gated. So that means that um, well, one of the consequences of this is that if you have um, two synapses that are next to each other on the dendritic branch, they will interact with each other synergistically. Um, so if you just activate uh, synapse A, you might get this, uh, this depolarization. If you activate synapse B, you'll get that depolarization. The linear sum of them will be the blue trace. And if you, if you have both of them at the same time, you will have this uh, much larger voltage deflection. And that it has to do with the, um, with the, uh, with the superlinearity, this voltage dependence of the NMDA receptor. Um, and this is, this is distance dependent. So if you, uh, if you put these two inputs on separate branches and you activate them simultaneously, you again get the linear sum. Um, so this is, what inspired, uh, this is what inspired Bartlett Mel um, to come up with this thing in 1991 called the clusteron. Uh, the idea is that instead of uh, having your neuron learn by adjusting synaptic weights, instead what you do is you have, you, uh, you use a nonlinear interaction between synapses. So you have this model that has a single long dendrite. And each synapse has something called an, an activation. And the activation is that synapse's in, weighted input times the sum of the weighted inputs of all of the other synapses within a certain region. So that's uh, determined by this di here. Um, and the, the way that you, uh, you learn using this, this model so first of all, I should say um, this this model is sensitive to correlations. So in other words, if you have two uh, if you have two synapses that are highly correlated and they sit next to each other, um, they'll they'll interact with each other uh, synergistically and will have something um, larger than if you just had uh, the linear sum of the two of them. And it's a multiplicative nonlinearity. So this the clusteron is basically a a neuron that that learns correlations. Um, and the, the learning algorithm for the cluster without getting too deeply into it is that you try to, so if you want the neuron to fire a spike for a given input, what you want to do is you want to 
for that input, for that input class, you want to put um, correlated inputs next to each other on the dendrite. So the way that you do that is you feed the neuron um, examples of your positive pattern. So in this case, that would be uh, if we're doing MNIST and we want to train this neuron to fire in response to, to zeros. So, so we present a bunch of zeros. We just present the positive class. Um, and we look at all the synapses on the dendrite and the synapses that are, that are weak. So the synapses whose activation is less than the average activation of the other synapses, we randomly swap them with each other. So I always compare this to, um, to, uh, to musical chairs, right? So it's, it's basically all the synapses get up and they swap with each other. And eventually over time, because you're swapping the weak synapses, eventually they, they find locations that uh, where they're activated more strongly. Um, so uh, when I, together with uh, Menachem Kalmanson, who is an undergraduate student, what we did um, is we came up with this thing called the gradient clustron. Uh, the thing is that with the, with the clustron algorithm, it's, um, it, it actually works, which is impressive, but it's, it's based on sort of randomly swapping synapses, which is not a very uh, sort of elegant and, and probably not particularly efficient way to learn. Um, so what we thought that we could do is instead of having these discrete synaptic locations, we would instead have a continuous dendrite. So, so, each, synapt so each synapse has a real valued location on the dendrite and each synapse interact with other synapses in a distance dependent manner. Um, so, w, so W4 will interact uh, more with W1 and less with W3 and so forth. Um, and the, inter, in, the interaction is described um, by this equation here, uh, but it's, it's basically just like I described that um, you, it's, it's a weighted, it's a distance weighted product um, that's based on just a, a bell shaped curve. And by doing this, uh, we were able to, by, by constructing the model in this way, sorry, uh, we were able to, um, to derive a gradient descent algorithm for the gradient clusteron. Um, this is the equation. The equation is not so important. The important thing is um, the uh, understanding the rules qualitatively. Um, and what you want to do is because these interactions are, are multiplicative. So if you want the neuron to fire a spike, that means that, that so it's a positive class pattern. You want same sign synapses to be close to each other because um, a positive times a positive is a positive and a negative times a negative is a positive. Um, so if you have same sign synapses next to each other, um, you'll have a stronger positive activation. So you attract, so in positive patterns, you attract same sign synapses. That was a tongue twister. And you, um, and you repel opposite sign synapses. And if it's a negative pattern, so you want to reduce the neurons overall output, um, you, do, you do the opposite. So same signs um, repel and opposite signs attract. The attraction and repulsion uh, depends on the magnitude of the weighted input in just a straightforward way. Um, a stronger weighted input means stronger attraction and repulsion. Uh, and the, the attraction and repulsion is also distance dependent. So it's a, it's a stronger force close by, um, uh, sorry, a, a weaker force very close by, stronger force medium, and, uh, and as you get further away, the, uh, the pull of the different synapses gets, um, gets uh, hmm. weaker again. And, and what was the, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. What was the loss function here? It was a just pure classification error or was there? Um, yeah, so it, it, it's a standard, uh, standard logit uh, loss function. So the same okay. that you for uh, like um, logistic regression. Yeah. Okay. And, and can synapses actually cross each other? Like, um... Yeah, 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 yeah. They don't so, bump into it. There's no collision or anything like okay, that. Okay, so they can sort of, yeah, completely, they could swap positions completely. Yeah. In principle. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to make this uh, the speaker view not obstruct the slides. I think I'll just give up. Um, yeah, we don't see the, we, we just see the full screen version. Ah, oh, okay. Oh, that's okay. perfect. Okay. Yeah. And that's not a problem. Okay. Um, so basically, if the, if the original clusteron is like playing musical chairs, the G clusteron is like, um, if you're on a long bench, right, not chairs, and you're sliding, uh, you know, towards your friend and away from your enemies. Um, so that's, uh, that's the idea. Um, now I just want to show it to you in action. So this is, um, this is a toy example. We just want to show 
uh, the G clustron increasing its overall activation. So it's going to want to try to put same time synapses next to each other. Um, so what we do is we just uh, put a bunch of uh, random, randomly, uh, uh, randomly initialized synapses along the dendrite. And then over time, this is what happens. So you create uh, clusters of excitatory and inhibitory synapses. Not especially useful. Uh, it's visually nice. Uh, so toy example number two is we want to show that you um, that you can learn correlations with this. So what we did is we created this multivariate Gaussian data set where each uh, group each group of uh, five consecutive input dimensions were correlated with each other. Um, so you see that in the correlation matrix here. It's easier to see just from the data set, right? So you can see within within every row. So the first five uh, pixels are correlated, the second five, third five, and so forth. Um, but within these groups of five, or between these groups of five, there aren't correlations. And that's really the only information, just that, that you, this, this correlational structure. Um, so again, we're going to, to present um, patterns from this data set. And uh, again, there's just a multivariate Gaussian with, with some correlations. Uh, and we're going to present it to the G clustron. We're initially going to, um, initialize them at random positions. Now, each of these shapes here is going to be one of these groups of the five consecutive inputs. So one to six will be a triangle, six to 11 will be a square and so forth. And so over the course of learning, what will happen is that, uh, I mean, it happens very quickly. You can see that it segregates out these groups of correlated inputs um, along the dendrite. So that's, uh, okay, so it can learn correlations. So now we'll try it on a real data set, well, semi-real. Um, so we're going to do uh, MNIST. Uh, and the, uh, the, the, the idea is essentially, like I said, you're learning correlations within the correlational structure of each, uh, uh, of each digit. Uh, and you can see that uh, before learning and, and after learning, so you get a nice uh, separation of the distributions of the positive patterns and the negative patterns. So this might be the number two, and this might be, I think we did like one versus rest. So we might've had like a thousand twos and a thousand of everything else. Uh, and this is what the distribution looked like. Uh, this, this corresponds to something like uh, 80 or 90% accuracy. I forget on the, on the one versus rest. Um, we also did, uh, oh, so I- is, is that with a single neuron? Um, yeah, 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 this yeah, is- okay. the, and we'll get to, I'll get to the all versus all and, and like the exact accuracies later. This is just like an illustration. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and you can also see that before learning and, and after, so before learning, there's basically no structure to uh, what happens uh, to the synapse. So I should say, so in, in this, this top plot here, there's red and blue. So red and blue um, corresponds to the activations of, um, there's like the, the, uh, synapses, but histogrammed by by location. So, uh, and for the positive and negative patterns. So before learning, it's just uh, random. And after learning, you see that you have these regions where um, uh, synapses that are um, uh, synapses that are associated with the positive patterns um, are much more strongly activated. Uh, but really, like the, the interesting thing here, I think, is is the density. So you see, uh, this is this is a, um, a histogram of the densities along the location, uh, along the dendrite, and you can see that um, before learning, there's like no structure, and after learning, you have these regions that are very dense that have a lot of synapses on them. Um, so you really have these clustered synaptic inputs, and that's what's uh, driving the learning, at least we think. Uh, okay, so in terms of performance, oh, I should say also, uh, we, we, so that was um, all of that, that separation that you saw before, that was just by changing the synaptic locations, no synaptic weights were used, but here, I mean, there were synaptic weights in the model, but they were all set to one. I think we actually accidentally set them to negative one, but it's the same because it's multiple, it doesn't matter. So, but anyway, <laughs> We also um, we also uh, have have a rule for updating the weights um, and up, updating the this this rule. I don't want to get basically you just multiply it by the activation uh, divided by the weight. So we have both the rule for changing the synaptic locations and the synaptic weights. Um, and 
we did uh, we did an all versus all paradigm. So 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 we had um, uh, we we had a not a network it was a single layer with ten neurons. And so we had that uh, that do the all versus all classification. We had two different paradigms. We, we had one paradigm where we used a soft max, one where we did one versus rest. Um, soft max generally does better. Um, here we, we were just the the point we were trying to make is that. With the with the original cluster on, you can't use a soft max because it's uh, not a gradient descent algorithm. Um, that's probably too technical. Bottom line is that uh, with the, with the G cluster on, you can get like um, you know 85, 90 percent accuracy on all versus all MNIST, which is basically the same that you get with logistic regression, um, and you get, you can get this accuracy um, only by using synaptic locations and not with synaptic weights. Um, so, right, so this is this is just with locations, and this is with weights, um, and this is with locations and weights. So you might do a little bit better with uh, having both locations and weights, but really, even if you can just modify the synaptic locations, uh, and you have a, a soft map, you can get like 85% accuracy on all versus all MNIST, uh, which I think is reasonably impressive for this algorithm that we just like made up and doesn't have synaptic weights and is just using uh, mm -hmm. correlations. Um, and what is, uh, yeah, you might have, I, I think I missed, what is OVR versus SM here? Yeah, sorry. So so OVR is um, one versus rest and SM is softmax. So oh, it, okay, okay. Architectures of how you propagate the, the signal. Right. Uh, yeah. and, and, and how many, is this all, and how many neurons did you use here? Is it 10 neurons? Yeah, this is case? just one, one neuron ten. for each digit, yeah. Okay, okay. So there's no... Um, you know, there's no hidden layer or anything like that. Each one is just doing a pure linear classification. Yeah, well, it, it, it's nonlinear because this, this is a, the, I mean, it's, uh, right, the G cluster on it is a nonlinear classification because it has all these mixed terms. That's how it works because it's working. With right, right. Okay, okay. Uh, but yeah, the, the comparison is to logistic regression, which is, which is a linear classifier. And yeah. um, so it does, uh, if you only have locations, it maybe does a little bit worse, but it's um, you know, about the same. But, but if each if yeah. each neuron is um, has these nonlinearities in principle, it has more capacity and more power than simple linear classifiers. So in, in theory, it should be able to do better, right? Well, so it, it's, it's a bit solver than that because, um, uh, okay, so, in, in theory, yes, but um, so the best way to think of it might be in terms of the number of parameters, uh, right? So the number of parameters here is, so if each synapse has just a location, right? So that's, that's the same number of parameters as each synapse having just weights. So mm -hmm. the kind of operations of boundaries that you draw will be different. They'll be more curvy, um, but that, is not being more curvy is not necessarily better with the same number of parameters. Uh, so, so I, I think I think it's best to think of it in terms of that. Now it's true. So when we have both locations and weights, you do have two times the number of parameters. Uh, so you'd think that you might get a bit of an increase uh, by doing that, but um, that's not necessarily guaranteed. So, for example, if you were to do logistic regression. And you were to just um, add in, uh, let's say, n mixed terms. So, so normally, so normally the mixed terms, if you do all of the uh, like x i times x j, right? Mm -hmm, so you have mm -hmm. the multiplications of the input. So that would give you n squared. But imagine that instead of n squared, you just like took two n of those of those mixed terms. Really, one yeah. one n. Yeah. Right, so you might get some increased classification capacity, but it would not necessarily be that great. Right, right. Uh, yeah. So Tovia, did you do any theoretical analysis of this algorithm? Because two things are coming to mind. One would be, is it actually guaranteed to converge? So there's the optimal behavior that this neuron could exhibit theoretically, but then there's the practical issue of actually finding the parameters and moving things around so that uh, you get that optimal behavior. So the first question is, do you have any guarantees about convergence? The second question is, did you do any theoretical analysis for something like the VC dimension of this model? Um, so the answer to that is is no. Um, it, it like it, it's it's a it's a good question. 
um, and I have thought about it. Uh, the problem, so it's it's complicated because um, so if it were just a simple quadratic classifier and you had all of like the n squared terms, um, that that might be easier. This is this is sort of a constrained quadratic classifier. So so okay, uh, maybe I'll take a step back. So Bartlett Mel. Um, he did a theoretical analysis with um, Porazi on the original clusteron, and so so that um, so the original clusteron is called a subsampled quadratic classifier because because the original clusteron uh, you have this fixed uh, regions of of interaction. So basically, there, there's a fixed number of mixed terms, and you know what they are. Um, so it, it's like you have these these n squared mixed terms. And um, uh, and you're you're just uh, selecting some of them. Yeah, you're going to get a so, sparse subset of those. Yeah, yeah. So ex exactly. So so the the G cluster one is a bit more confusing because you actually have all of the mixed terms, um, but the mixed terms are kind of uh, tied together. Why the reason why they're tied together is because the uh, the spatial constraint of being along a single um, dendrite means that there are certain. So if you imagine you have um, you have a, a matrix of the coefficients of all of these these mixed terms, um, so you can't change those coefficients independently because they're all sitting on a dendrite. So if you change one of them, you will have to change the other ones because they're they're a constraint, right? So so like if you have three points. And A is to the left of B, and B is to the left of C. So A has to be to the left of C, uh, right? So, so it, it's definitely it's an interesting problem theoretically, but yeah, we didn't uh, we didn't do that analysis. Um, one thing that we did do is uh, we showed that as long as you have a single bias synapse, so by bias synapse I mean just a a, a synapse, a, a, a G cluster on synapse that works like all the other synapses that has a constant input. So the G cluster on is able to um, uh, can can basically implement any linear separation boundary, right? So so the G the G clustron is capable of doing all of the things that a linear classifier is capable of doing in theory. Um, and then we have one more thing. So this is this is uh, uh, just we want we wanted to show that the G clustron can be a bit better. Uh, so the simplest way to do that is to show that it can solve the exclusive or problem. So exclusive or problem is good. You you have uh, two two binary bits of input and it returns a one if the bits are different and it returns a zero if the bits are the same, right? So one, one returns a zero, zero, one returns a one. Uh, and you can't use a linear classifier to separate um, or to solve the exclusive or problem because if you plot them on this X, Y plane, uh, there's no line that you can draw that will, uh, that will separate them. Um, so we show, um, we show uh, anal analytically that uh, a solution for exclusive or does exist in, in the G clustron. Um, so if you you can add a, you can show that if you satisfy certain inequalities with the weights and the locations, so you you have a solution in this in this region. What this region basically is is it means that the the synapses are like opposite signs and are next to each other. Uh, so so this uh, this configuration. Um, when I say opposite signs, I mean the uh, right the, the signs of the synaptic weights. So this configuration where one of the weights is negative, one of the weights is positive, and the synapses are next to each other on, on the dendrite, you can um, solve the exclusive or problem with that configuration. So uh, you can, if you have both the weight rule and the location rule, you can solve uh, the exclusive or problem from arbitrary initial conditions. If you only have, if you only have the weight rule or only have the location rule, then it depends on what the initialization is, right? Because if you imagine if you if you initialize them far apart, but you're not allowed to change locations, then you can never get them into this configuration. And if you initialize them with the wrong weights, uh, and you're not allowed to change the weights, then you, you also can't get them to into this configuration. So you really kind of need. Uh, both if you want to be able to, to solve exclusive or from arbitrary initial conditions. Um, again, it's really, it, it's just a toy problem, but it lets us say that uh, that the G clusteron is better in some way than a linear neuron. And this is sort of the, the easiest way to do it. That's the simplest way, yeah. And, and, and in the weight learning here, you do allow the weights to cross sign. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. 
here, yeah, here okay. uh, there are a lot of things about the gradient cluster arm that aren't super biologically plausible. Um, but I, I just I think that the idea that I that emerges from this that synapses can attract and repel each other, um, I think is uh, is a very compelling idea. And you can imagine this happens via via chemical gradients. Um, so one of the things that we that we say in the paper is that you can actually um, one way to think about the update rule is as though you have um, like almost a, a force field along along a dendrite. So if you have a particular configuration of synapses along a dendrite, um, and you have a, a unit synapse with the weight weight and, and input value one, so you can show along the dendrite where that unit synapse would want to move to. So it's like like putting a charge in an electrical field or something. Um, so if you imagine that you have chemical gradients along along the dendrite that can tell synapses. Uh, synapses where to move or maybe where to create new synapses based on the activity of, of other synapses, I think that's, uh, that's an interesting idea. Hmm. Uh, Another way this could possibly happen, um, it's not exactly, it's not this learning rule, but if you think about structural plasticity, where you can add and drop synapses, if, if a particular input really wants to be connected to a different physical location along the dendrite, you could imagine learning rules that, you know, drop drop the synapse in one location and and create a synapse at the other uh, location you know that that can with structural plasticity you could it, you can also imagine ways to sort of create these clusters um it, you know. right 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 so this this is effectively this is a structural plasticity algorithm exactly yeah yeah yeah, so that's that's um, that is the way to think about it yeah i've I've gone through hoops in my head trying to figure out uh, exactly. Uh, how it would how it would look biologically. Um, there there are some nice uh, like molecular biology papers. Uh, I'm forgetting. I think uh, there was a paper with like Klein or whatever. There so so there there is definitely a lot of chemical signaling for structural plasticity. So there's stuff with like BDNF and um, like TRPK or something. There there are, there are a lot of chemicals that are involved with uh, signaling to like uh, strengthen um, Coactive synapses. Uh, yeah. So, but anyway, that's uh, there are there are there more questions on this part? I think yeah, I was kind of interested in the the chart you showed where you showed the I uh, forget what you called it, but you're showing location along the x-axis and the uh, amount of clustering or uh, things on the y-axis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Synapse density. Yeah. Um, and you know, typically when people model active dendrites, the simplest way is just to carve it out into these discrete segments. Um, and you know, Bartlett modeled it that way, and we modeled it that way as well. And it seems like you're kind of getting close to that on the bottom right uh, chart. There, it's it, you know, you have specific discrete areas where there's significant density, and you could almost it's almost like you could partition that into uh, separate segments there. Um, so, I mean, I, I sort of think that by definition, if you have a cluster, then necessarily you will able, be able to post facto partition the regions with clusters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that the, that, so, right. So first of all, that's, that's sort of a, a, a post facto thing with that. Um, but the, the way that you get there might not be a discrete way, right. Which is, mm -hmm. which is. Sure. Yeah. Um, and and also, I think that uh, you might you might have let's say variation in the size of these clusters because this is also you know when you when you produce these things, it's also very contingent on like bin size and stuff. Uh, you know, so it it looks like these highly dense. Uh, and oh, sorry. Um, also, these uh, because of the way that the algorithm works. So if if you let the algorithm run for a long time. Um, uh, well, I have to, yeah, I have to think about it some, but, but clustered, th this sort of clustered structure, uh, is sort of an attractor. If, if you think of the examples that I gave before with the, with the correlated inputs and the different shapes. Um, so in, in an idealized, in an idealized situation, they all eventually coral, uh, they converge to like a single point almost. Right. Right. Yeah. I was also thinking just in terms of, um, you know, NMDA spikes and NMDA spiking thresholds, 
you know, the, I don't, again, I don't mean to put too much into it, but the spiking thresholds are sort of roughly in this area, right? You know, 10 to 15 synapses. Um, again, I don't know how biologically close your parameters are at all, but it's kind of interesting that um, these spikes are well above the spiking threshold and the other, the non-clustered areas seem to be below that threshold. Right. Yeah. The, right. So that, yeah, it is. Um... Again, I don't want to read more into it <laughs> than, than I should, but it was just an, inter it's just an observation. I'm not at all biological. And this is also, this is just on MNIST, right? Sure. So sure. This, this is like what you get for MNIST, which has a particular, you know, number of inputs and particular correlational structure. Um, but yeah, but these thresholds are uh, seem to be very universal. Uh, as long as you have sparsity and reasonable dimensionality, you get some reasonable uh, threshold above which you can get you can do pretty accurate classification. So it, it, true, this is just MNIST, but there is something somewhat universal about those thresholds uh, according to our theoretical analysis yesterday. As long uh, anyway, as long as you have sufficiently high dimensionality and sufficient sparsity. Right. Yeah, no. So that's um, right. I remember. Yeah, because because right. It's about eight, something like eight synapses. Uh, well, no, it really depends. So it, it, it depends. Have... But uh, the minimum NMDA spiking threshold is around eight or nine. Um, right. That, that I've seen in the literature. Right. Yeah, we, we were actually yeah. around with that a lot. Um, uh, yes, that that is true, whether that's some sort of uh, universal thing that's good for computation, or it, it might just be a thing that biology has some sort of mechanism to simultaneously activate, right? So, so there might be a, a thing called clustered activation, which is a separate thing than like individually randomly activating them. But yeah, I, I don't- Yeah, I, don't... I mean, you, you can actually show this analytically, the, the probability of errors drops pretty dramatically at certain thresholds and you know, above if you were to have a higher threshold, it doesn't you know help you too much. So there's some, you know, that the, there is some analytical reason to to believe in this sort of number, a threshold around ten, you know, somewhere or, or maybe a little bit higher. Sometimes, you know, it, it does vary depending on the exact conditions. But um, again, if you have sufficiently high dimensionality and reasonably sparse inputs, um, you can you can get by with sort of absolute thresholds across a wide range of tasks. That's uh, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I would, uh, do you have, do you have a, like a paper about that? Yeah, yeah, there's a paper, I, have a, I can point you to that. And I, I presented this at, at Cosine a few years ago as well and talked to a bunch of the uh, dendritic experimentalists. Because people were really worried why these thresholds were so low. Um, you know, if you have extremely noisy inputs coming in and you have, you know, thousands of inputs on this neuron, how could you possibly do anything reasonable with a threshold of eight <laughs> or nine? And you can actually show analytically, that's actually, it's a pretty decent threshold uh, as long as you have sparsity. Right. Um, cool. Uh, okay. That's so, a separate, that's a separate thing. I can, I can send you a link yeah. to that later. Okay. So I, I have three more, three more papers to get. Through. So, well, well, let's, let's just see what we can do. Um, so, uh, the next thing I wanted to do is I, um, we're interested in the actual, actual biological mechanisms of plasticity. Uh, so these, uh, perceptron algorithm, gradient clustron algorithm and so forth, um, are really, uh, like really, we just made them up. Uh, there's, you know, you can sort of hand wave about, uh, how they happen biologically. Um, but, but really they were designed to, um, to solve classification tasks. So we wanted to get into the biology of, of, uh, of real plasticity. Uh, so typically when people, when biologists talk about plasticity, there are two uh, experimental protocols that you can get, um, what they call long-term plasticity. Uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer because long-term plasticity may only last 10 minutes, uh, but uh, we'll ignore that for the moment. Um, the, um, Right, so there's something, there's frequency dependent plasticity, which is a presynaptic only protocol. So if you have very slow frequency inputs, so for example, you're, you're stimulating presynaptic axons, um, very slow inputs will not really um, 
uh, will not really induce plasticity if you get to a sort of a medium level of um, of the of the input frequency you get depression uh, and if you have a high frequency of stimulation you have potentiation so that's frequency dependent plasticity and there's another kind of plasticity called spike timing dependent plasticity where you have um, if you have a postsynaptic spike before presynaptic spike you have depression presynaptic before postsynaptic you have potentiation um, so the in terms of uh, oh so First of all, I should say this is a project that um, and with, with Lee Azran, who is an undergraduate student, um, who is, uh, she's going to Chile for like a month. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, she, she worked with, with me on this and we want to, to sort of understand the, the biological mechanisms under, uh, underlying plasticity. Um, and uh, what people think in terms of the, the molecular stuff that's going on, is that when you're doing the synaptic potentiation, um, calcium enters the cell either through the NMDA receptor or uh, through voltage-gated calcium channels, although they're not shown here. Um, so calcium enters the cell, um, it interacts with CAMK2, and AMPA receptors are, are shuttled to the synaptic spine. So that so you have an increased conductance, we have an increased synaptic strength. And with synaptic depression, uh, calcium comes into the cell, uh, it interacts with calcineurin, and uh, AMP receptors are removed from the spine. So both of these processes start with calcium entry. So the question is, uh, how does the synapse know whether to potentiate or depress? So this leads us to the calcium control hypothesis. Calcium control hypothesis says that if you have, that, that everything depends on the concentration of calcium in the postsynaptic spine. So if you have not very much calcium, nothing happens. If you have a medium amount of calcium, you have depression. And if you have a lot of calcium, um, you have potentiation. Um, and so uh, um, there are uh, there are models that have that have shown that uh, from this from this calcium control hypothesis, from this cal from this concentration based pool, you can get those effects of um, frequency dependent plasticity um, uh, uh, and spike timing dependent plasticity. I don't want to get into that so much. We also did some modeling of that. Um, there are a few other important things about biological plasticity. So biological plasticity saturates. So instead of, uh, you know, if you have like a normal learning algorithm, like the perceptron, you can just uh, keep going up forever and keep going down forever. Um, in biology, so synaptic strength will, uh, will saturate. Eventually, you just uh, potentiate the synapse so much uh, it won't get any stronger and you can weaken it so much that it won't get any weaker. And, it, and the, the bottom is not necessarily zero. You might have also like a minimum non-zero uh, synaptic strength also. So you have, uh, you seem to see this, uh, this saturation. And then finally, there's this thing called um, late phase plasticity, which has to do with, so this, um, these protocols that I, that I said, they last like 10 minutes. So um, the reason why I say that is because uh, initially, uh, when you do, when you do the protocol, so you get a, a very large increase in the synaptic weight. But if you wait like 10 hours, um, the synaptic weight will decrease to baseline. Now, I should say this is if you block protein synthesis in the cell. Um, so if you block protein synthesis in, in the cell, plasticity is really uh, temporary, uh, this, this, this calcium-based stuff. So the calcium happens within, let's say, on order of hundreds of milliseconds, maybe seconds. Um, but without, without protein, it just goes back to baseline. If you have uh, protein synthesis, the, the synaptic uh, weight is stabilized, and the same thing happens for um, for depression. Um, so, so we want to um, we want to have a model that recapitulates these these three uh, properties. So, the the calcium concentration dependence, the saturation, and the uh, decay back to baseline in the absence of protein synthesis. Um, so, there are two models already that exist that do this. Um, there's one uh, by Chauval and one by Grapner and Brunel. Um, we made our own rule, which is, I think, a, a bit more um, elegant and, and intuitive that captures all of these properties. And it's also more flexible. Um, we call this the fixed point learning rate rule. Um, and the idea is that, that the calcium, uh, you can individually, uh, individually specify the fixed points and the learning rates uh, of, the, of plasticity as a function of the calcium. 
Um, so this is the equation, but just to, to illustrate what I mean by this, so we'll give this uh, calcium step stimulus, um, a lot of calcium, uh, so potentiative calcium, depressive calcium. Um, and if you do that, uh, um, so, so you do that and then, and then you turn off the calcium and then you sort of see what happens. Um, so to illustrate this, these dynamics, so if you have this potentiative level of calcium, so the fixed point learning rate says, okay, potentiative level of calcium, you go up to this, um, this is the upper fixed point. That's the fixed point specified over here. This is the potentiative region of calcium. Um, if you have a depressive amount of calcium, you go to the fixed point specified uh, over here. So that's this lower fixed point here. Um, and then finally, when you turn off the calcium, you go back to this to the middle fixed point. So this is uh, going back to baseline. That's that, um, uh, that's that late phase uh, drift back to baseline that you have without protein synthesis. We also have a model for when you do have protein synthesis. Um, I'm not gonna mention it here, but this is just sort of the basic a structure of um, of the rule, and wow, I have five minutes left. <laughs> uh, okay, so so um, very very. Can I just orient a little bit. Is is the kind of overall idea here that um, this calcium based learning rule sort of operates like a learning rate scheduler that's sort of biologically inspired? I just need to get like the overall context for that. I, I may have missed it. Yeah, so the, the overall context is that this is supposed to approximate what happens in biology. Um, now, in terms of in terms of the consequence of it for um, for learning rates, um, so I a little bit think of it as like um, you know like an L one or L two loss. So, um, so so with uh, right. So so if you if you have weight penalization, what L one and L two. Uh, uh, loss penalizations do is that they say, well, if the sum of the weights is too big, then um, you know, then then we basically penalize that. So this is a little this you can think of it as a different way of penalizing weights, where in, instead of um, putting it in, into loss function, we just say that the way that synapses adjust their weights is that sort of you have a maximum and minimum weight. And the closer that you get to the maximum or the closer that you get to the minimum, uh, the less you're going to change. So this is a, a saturating kind of learning rule. Uh, so that's that's how I would describe it from a machine learning perspective. That, okay, that makes so sense. I, I should not think of it just maybe in terms of a learning rate scheduler, but actually in terms of like uh, changing the overall objective function and governing how the weights uh, change. Yeah, I, I don't even know if I would I would talk about it in terms of the objective function because really this is at the level of the learning algorithm, um, right? Because this is, uh, you know, I I don't I don't know if this is optimal for something. I my intuition is that it actually probably is computationally useful for something, but this is this is really designed to, uh, to imitate just what we observe in biology. Um, but yeah, like you can definitely think of scenarios uh, when this would, would be helpful. My my intuition is is like this. Um, you know, penalizing large weights might be other ways to think about it. Um, okay, but yeah, I see that the overall aim is is biologically focused, so I won't uh, you know force the machine learning point of view on it. Yeah, no, so somebody probably should. So so in this, yeah, I, I have two minutes left. So. Um, do you guys have to have to like run somewhere? If I have, I can probably finish if I have ten more minutes. But it's up to you. Well, I can I can stay on a few more minutes. I can't stay on too much longer. I do have something else, but uh, I can stay on five ten more minutes. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just um yeah. So I'll I'll just uh, run through this stuff uh, fairly quickly. So so we have this this learning rule. It's really a plasticity rule um, for. Uh, for calcium, and the question is, we want to now be able to construct learning rules from this calcium-based plasticity rule. Um, so to do that, we develop a, a, a model neuron that basically has calcium. So it's basically a, a linear neuron, um, but each, um, and so, so uh, yeah, so it's a linear neuron and it has calcium sources. So the calcium sources are, so you can have like uh, calcium from local sources, so that's, that's um, at the synapse, that's from the input itself, you can have heterosynaptic calcium, um, which 
which comes from other synapses. I don't really have time to explain that. I'll explain it more in a second. Um, but you also have calcium from the spike, and you can have calcium from a supervising signal. Uh, and each of these calcium sources is associated with a coefficient, alpha, beta, gamma, or delta. Uh, and so based on the activity of, of the neuron, you'll get a certain amount of calcium. Uh, and then depending on what these coefficients are, uh, that, that can give rise to different learning rules. Uh, so it's a very simple example, heavy in learning. Um, uh, you set the coefficient such that uh, the local calcium alone or the postsynaptic spike alone they give you calcium, which is below the depression threshold. But if you have both of them together, they sum up and are above the potentiation threshold, right? So this gives you fire together, wire together. Uh, you can also get uh, out of sync, lose your link just by uh, raising up the individual ones to be above the depression threshold. Um, there are uh, a lot of other things we did with this. There are, uh, you can do a lot of learning rules. You can do the perceptron with this if you have a supervisor. Um, uh, we did homeostatic plasticity. That's the calcitron. Uh, and then finally, there's this, um, this project that I did with Menachem Kalmanson that I think will interest you, uh, that um, this has to do with heterosynaptic plasticity. So sometimes you can induce plasticity at that one synapse, say the middle synapse, you'll, you'll get potentiation. And then if you look at other synapses, you'll get depression. So there's a uh, John Lisman who basically invented calcium-based plasticity. He had this theory that the at the synapse that you induce plasticity at, that's called the homosynaptic uh, synapse. And there, the way that you get calcium is through the NMDA receptor, uh, that, and that's just directly from, from the presynaptic input. Also, you have the voltage-gated calcium channel because you're depolarizing the spine. Now, since you're depolarizing the dendrite with this input, some of that, uh, some of that current also travels and depolarizes other spines. So that depolarization, it doesn't, it won't open up the NMDA receptor because NMDA receptor requires um, neurotransmitter, but it will open up the voltage-gated calcium channels. Um, so this is one theory of how you get um, heterosynaptic plasticity. Uh, now, if you do this in a cable model of a dendrite, there is a thing to know about uh, dendrites, which is that uh, voltage attenuates in dendrites. So if you put a synapse, you have, uh, this is a ball and stick cable model of a dendrite. And if you put a synapse somewhere in the middle of the dendrite, um, uh, so the, vol the voltage will attenuate towards the soma. So if you see, if you look at this image here, so this direction is, is towards the distal tip of the dendrite and this direction is towards the soma, this axis is time. Uh, and so if you stimulate the synapse, you see that distally you depolarize a lot and proximally, um, Proximally, uh, you get much, you get a lot of attenuation. Uh, and if you do an NMDA spike, so this is what the NMDA spike looks in the dendrite. So again, depolarize a lot distally, and then it attenuates proximally. And if you have a branching dendrite, you get this kind of structure. You put the synapse over here, you depolarize uh, this dendritic branch. So these are this is a branching structure of a dendrite, right? This is branch one, two, et cetera. Um, so you depolarize everything that's distal to you. And then you attenuate towards the soma. And uh, yeah, here, here you also you depolarize a sister branch because the sister branch is basically gets the depolarization from the proximal branch here. So this is just a property of the biophysics from the fact that the soma is, is acts as an electrical sink because it's attached to a bunch of other dendrites. Um, okay, so this is, this is nice, but we knew, we've known this since, uh, since Rawl, since the 1960s. But the cool thing is that now if you think about heterosynaptic plasticity, uh, and you think about this asymmetric attenuation of voltage. So maybe what you can do is you can, uh, you, if you have a strong input to, to somewhere on a dendrite, so this again is just a ball and stick. You have a strong input, you induce an NMDA spike. Maybe you can induce heterosynaptic plasticity at all of the locations that are distal to the input, but not at locations proximal to the input. So where this becomes cool is if you have a branching dendrite, and you have a strong input, let's say here at this branch, so you can depolarize the entire branch distally to you. Or if you, um, here, this is a slightly more proximal branch, so you need a, more inputs because lower input resistance. But again, you can, you can depolarize and induce plasticity at, the, at that entire um, distal subtree. So this, is, I, uh, this can be thought of as a hierarchical um, uh, plasticity supervision rule, 
uh, hierarchical in the sense that if you have a, a, pro, a more proximal input, that proximal input is a supervisor uh, to everyone who's distal to it. So, so this, this location is in control of all these locations and say this location is in control of all of those locations. Um, so this uh, is probably computationally useful for something. Uh, I haven't gotten uh, as far as to um, understand exactly what, but I, I think that, you know, if you think about like Bartlett Mel's two layer model, um, uh, this, this might be a learning rule that uh, you might want to use in that sort of context. Um, so to summarize everything, so we have the biophysical perceptron, which says that the real biologically detailed neurons can implement the perceptron learning algorithm. We have the gradient clustron with the traction and repulsion of synapses. The fixed point learning rate for calcium, I didn't say it this way, but I'll say it now. Calcium tells the synaptic weights where to go and how fast they get there. That's that, that saturating plasticity. We have the calcitron, which is that you can have um, different learning rules that you can create using calcium-based plasticity. And finally, there is hierarchical heterosynaptic plasticity uh, that I just showed you now that proximal, more proximal inputs can act as supervisors for the distal subtrees. Sorry, I realize I, <laughs> I ran through a lot. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I apologize that we were asking too many questions in the beginning there and I made you go too fast here. Um, but any, any other questions from, from anyone? Yeah, uh, to Tobia, thanks for, for this interesting presentation. Yeah. Um, I, I might have missed it. Did you, in your work, use any word like conduction delays along an axon? Oh, along an axon. Yeah. Uh, no, because because yeah, so so we're not so I'm so because I'm I'm working on the single neuron. My perspective is that I care I care about everything that happens up until the soma of the postsynaptic neuron, and mm -hmm. I also am not thinking about the presynaptic. Right, I'm thinking about the presynaptic neurons just as like neurotransmitter release. Um, so axonal delays. Um, uh, I'm not so, so in your case, all of the inputs are arriving simultaneously. You're not looking at any sort of time, you know, sequence, temporal sequences right. or any sort of temporal delays right. in the inputs so, coming in. Is that... Yeah. So if, if you want temporal sequences, I, I will direct you to um, my colleague, David Benyaguyev's work, whose work is entirely about, uh, about um, temporal sequences. Um, so, so he has, a, uh, I think it's still a preprint out now. Um, I forgot exactly what the title is, but it's called the filter and fire neuron. So, so that so that work is entirely about uh, delays along the, the dendritic tree, uh, not along the axon. Uh, and the claim mm -hmm. that he makes is that because you have uh, dendrites are you can think of sort of as as delay lines, so you can sort of think of them as doing. Um, as, as being like Fourier modes of, of the input because they respond uh, to inputs of, of different frequency differently. Um, I'm probably not explaining that very well, um, but uh, it, it's, a very, it's a very nice work. And if you're interested in uh, the temporal dendritic filtering, that, that is like the work to go to. And it, it, it was just, uh, you put it on BioArca like, uh, yeah, this year. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, anything you know, else? more general question. Um, I don't remember the details of this, but I kind of recall some data saying that the amount of uh, neurotransmitter released can actually vary to a surprising degree. So like from one spike to the next, you can have like a lot of neurotransmitter released or a really small amount released. Did you ever look into like uh, robustness or um, tolerances to like stochastic amounts of neurotransmitters? Uh, are you talking about the in the first uh, project in the, the biophysical perceptron? Um, I, yeah, I'm not really sure. I guess it just it just occurred to me, like thinking back to the biology, that this was a, a yeah. data point that I wanted to kind of compare against. So, if the answer is yeah, I guess more generally, that, kind of that's fine. Yeah, more more generally, like sort of noisy inputs, I guess. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, if if you so in the context of um, of the biophysical perception. Okay, so right. So I should say generally, um, yeah, that, that neuro neurotransmitter release is just one of many, many forms of noise that can exist. Um, so uh, but one of the things that we did with the biologic with a biophysical perceptron is that we did an experiment with um, where we basically did bit flips, right? So we just turned the ones in, into zeros or vice versa uh, randomly, and we did different proportions of these bit flips. And we wanted to see um, how, how robust it is, you know, if, if we 
you know, flip 10 of the synapses, 20, 50. Um, and I have the results in the paper. I don't have them here. Uh, but basically, you have what you expect, which is that, um, you know, the more bits that you flip, uh, the worse performance becomes. But, you know, if you, if you flip 10 synapses, you can, it will, it will still, uh, you know, do reasonably well. Uh, so, yeah, so in, 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 the, in the blue brain, when they do these cable models and they have these synapses, they actually have in the model synapse, uh, they have it, the, the synaptic release is probabilistic and, um, uh, and they, they, have, they also have like uh, a synaptic depression facilitation because you have, um, uh, uh, what's it called? You have vesicles that are, uh, that are like used up and then that are docked and there's a whole process of getting them to, so, uh, so these, these are things that exist in, in more detailed models. Um, I didn't address it so much, except in, in the case of the biophysical perceptron. Yeah, we did do that, that noise robustness check. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Okay. Anything else? We good? No, uh, thank you so much for uh, attending. I know it's a uh, late you know, evening your time or night late night. night your time. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for presenting to us. Yeah, thanks, Tobia. Sure thing. Yeah, it was uh, great talking to you guys.